All right, welcome everyone to another exciting TIES webinar. Today we are joined by John Mead, who might be the original TIES core member. See, that's what it appears to me. So we're excited to have him. He's presented uh, before on Homo Naledi, and we're gonna learn more about that today. Every time he speaks, I get goosebumps, and I just get so excited. So John, don't let me down. And uh, we're really excited. If you guys are attending live, please type in your questions for John at the bottom chat. And then after the presentation, I will direct the best questions to him. And without further ado, take it away, Mr. John Mead. Okay, thank you, Kenny. I appreciate it. And thanks to everybody who is here. I'm excited to um, introduce um, a number of you to um, the great story that is and has been and will continue to be Homo Naledi and its discovery. So i um, going to go cover a lot of stuff about the early days of the discovery for those of you not yet familiar with it, um, as well as there has been a bunch of uh, new stuff and promises over the coming months to be even more exciting things. And one of the things I love about teaching this to my students is that it's a story that itself keeps evolving, we can say. And it's not just, oh, some, some people discovered some stuff a while ago and that's the whole story. No, this story keeps developing, which is one of the things I love. And I love in telling my middle school students that they have the chance for this to be something that they work on when they are in college, graduate school and the like. So it's not just something that you know was discovered and it's over and done with. No, we're constantly learning more. So I'm gonna dive right in. Uh, I'm gonna try to go pretty quickly so uh, I can get y'all out before midnight because this is one of those uh, stories that literally you can go on and on and on and on. And I will say at various times, I'll tell you, uh, this is going to be in the Wakelet. I've created a um, curated resource kind of file for, for y'all. And at the end, I'll have links to that so that the things that you say, oh, I, I want to save that somewhere, you'll have access to all of that. So, so let's uh, jump ahead here. Okay. And um, so I first got interested in human origins and teaching about it when I was even a little kid. And early in teaching, I had the incredible opportunity to meet Jane Goodall. And I asked her what her success, what she thought her success came from. And she said the fact that she was the first person to connect people to chimpanzees had to do with the stories of those chimpanzees. And that's children love that. And that was what teachers could do in connecting um, science for students. So I develop what I often refer to as science telling. It's more than storytelling. It's got the science behind it, but it is based on stories. And this, as I've said, is, is a special story. And for me, it started back in 2012 when there was a new story for me to tell. Um, I've taught human origins in my classes here at St. Mark's School in Dallas for now, gosh, 33 years. And there was this new discovery of a species in South Africa called Australopithecus sediba. It deserves its own webinar, um, but suffice to say, I knew about it, it was exciting. There were these two skeletons and skeletons in this field are very rare. Most of what gets discovered are scraps. And this scientist in South Africa named Dr. Lee Berger had discovered them, but I didn't know the discovery story of them. So I reached out to him in August of 2012. And here was our first conversation. And by the way, this is a great example of the fact that your digital footprint, it remains out there long after you think it's gone. Because I know it was August 20th, 2012 at 8.54 PM, because that's the timestamp on things. And I had said, hey, greetings from Texas. I'm honored to be a Facebook friend with you here. Can I steal a few minutes of your day? And I kind of expected that I'd probably be ignored or that, you know, the voice of Foghorn Leghorn would come up and say, 
boy, boy, I said, boy, you bother me, go away. I didn't expect that uh, Dr. Berger would respond with a four letter word. And that was sure. And we had a conversation. He said, well, tell me about your school. Cause I was asking him basically, could he share through email maybe the, the discovery story of Australopithecus sediba? And what turned out was the fact that, oh, he was just about to publish a book uh, called The Skull on the Rock with a friend of mine, Mark Aronson. And that was going to come out in a few months after our conversation. And he would be in Dallas visiting family um, in November. And I reached out and said, is it possible you could come and visit my school? And lo and behold, he did. And so here in November of uh, 2012, he spent the day on campus. Then uh, we did an evening uh, talk at the uh, Perot Museum of Nature and Science. And that night over dinner, he blew me away when he said, you know, Dallas has been such a warm reception for me and, and for this discovery. You really, as a teacher, need to come down to South Africa and see the Sediba bones for yourself. Um, after I picked my jaw up off the floor, I, um, I had to tell him that as much as I appreciated it, I couldn't do it because I had another um, obligation that summer during the week he had suggested. And then as dumb luck would have it, that job that I had set up fell through. And so I was then through generosity of some school donors was able to make it down to Johannesburg, South Africa in June of 2013, where I got to visit the excavation site for Australopithecus sediba. I got to interact with the bones you see in the middle uh, photograph there. And I even got to meet one of my oldest uh, friends from my childhood days of learning about paleoanthropology, the Tong child over there on the right. And so it was an incredible experience. I came back to Dallas just, you know, on cloud nine thinking, this is the best thing that could have ever happened to me. And I figured it was, you know, I had, I had reached the top of the mountain. There was nowhere higher to go. I didn't realize what was ahead because in September of 2013, the two guys you see on the screen here, okay, on the left, Stephen Tucker, on the right, Rick Hunter, were amateur cavers and they had connected with Dr. Berger through another friend of theirs, a, a man named Pedro Boshoff. And they were exploring caves in the cradle of humankind, the area surrounding Joh Johannesburg. And they were looking for possible new surprises, much like Sediba had been. They went into the most well-known cave in all of that area, it's kind of the place where you go if you are learning how to be a caver. And they got to the end of the map and they saw a crevice and being cavers, they're just a little bit crazy in a good way. And so um, they said, well, what happens if we go down this crack that's not on the map? Mind you, it's a crack that's about as wide as a dollar bill. And they wound up going down, down about 35, 40 feet. And then they dropped into um, a chamber. And this we now um, call this area we're, we're going to refer to as the Dinaletti chamber. And they noticed, as you can probably see, um, white specks on the floor, basically bones. And if you look uh, closely, you can see here's part of a, what looks like a jawbone. You have some long bones, um, and then maybe you can see kind of a circular piece here that may be part of a skull. Well, they realized that this, this is just the sort of thing they, Dr. Berger might have wanted them to, um, to check out. So they hurried back up um, and eventually got to Dr. Berger and said, here's what we have. And he realized that these bones needed to get out of there quickly because if you notice there's some white whiteness on the edges, these bones had been broken before Rick and Steve got down there. So it was possible that unbeknownst to anybody, someone else 
had wandered across this area and potentially done some damage. So he realized had to come out quickly. And so um, he took these pictures, contacted National Geographic, and basically got funding on the spot to be able to put together a team. And he knew he needed to get this team in there quickly. So he took advantage of what was still a fairly new thing in 2012. He put an ad out on Facebook. And he thought there might be a handful of folks who could one, get down that narrow passage as well as have the excavation skills to do what needed to be done. And so without reading you all of um, this, it basically says, I need people who are physically capable of squeezing into these very, very narrow spaces and who also have a specific skill set to do this. Please contact me. Um, we hope to have a team up and running by early November. And remember, this is probably early October of 2013. And lo and behold, he was surprised that close to 60 people applied. They narrowed that down to about a dozen, and then they um, Skyped with those folks, putting them through any number of challenges to make sure they had kind of the right stuff. And in the end, wound up choosing these six young women who from all over the world, from Australia, Canada, the United States, and they, and even one from here in Texas, believe it or not. And um, they came down and, you know, within a couple of weeks, they were down in South Africa and their job was to go through into this rising star cave. And here they would enter in over here on the left. And you can see they would then go down to a place that you'll see in a moment called Superman's Crawl, and then into a larger uh, chamber here known as the Dragon's Back because you had to climb up a, um, a ridge line here, um, about 35, 40 feet up that you can see why they call it Dragon's Back, like these spines on the back of a dragon. And then you get up to the top and then you go down what they call the chute. That's the eight inch wide gap. And then into the uh, Dinaletti chamber, named that way in the Sutu language, which means chamber of stars in honor of the cave itself, the rising star cave. So this was the deal on it. They got really good at it and were able eventually to, to go from surface to Dinaletti chamber in half an hour to 40 minutes. And because it was such a tight squeeze, they had to set up all of the, um, command center up outside the cave and wired um, cameras, uh, microphones, actually old telephones in so that they could watch the excavation in the Dinaletti chamber. Because again, only very few people were physically um, capable of getting in. And certainly most of the senior scientists, Dr. Berger included, um, were not what uh, he would say physiologically appropriate to make it in there. And so as a result, um, everything was watched from up above and very quickly it felt like um, a space mission. And the, the six uh, excavation scientists took on the nickname of underground astronauts uh, for just that reason. And here you get to see pictures of this three week um, experience of going down on the left here, you have uh, Dr. Berger's daughter, Megan, who was one of the safety cavers um, and the, um, the caving crew, by the way, wears the orange jumpsuits, which here in the United States tend to be prison wear, um, but not so in South Africa. So very different meaning. But she was uh, played a big role in helping out, as did Dr. Berger's son, Matthew. And then here on the right, you can see uh, team members in the Dinaletti chamber actually uh, doing 3D scanning. So before they moved any of the bones, they scanned the surface so that they could reconstruct digitally the dig at a later time. And then at the end of uh, day one, the first bag of fossils came up and you could see the excitement on everybody's face. The assumption was there was probably just one skeleton in there. And very quickly that turned out not to be the case. Uh, when it became, I think the time they had three, uh, 
bright femurs come out, it became clear that this was a collection of skeletal remains, not just one individual. And this began part of the mystery of what were these creatures and what were they doing down there? Here you see the, the underground astronauts posing as if they were NASA astronauts, the idea uh, mimicking the, the great uh, right stuff photograph of the 1960s. And just to give those of you who have never uh, explored caves before a sense of things, here's uh, this is a clip Dr. Berger narrating, uh, but this is Rick Hunter going through uh, Superman crawl. Dangerous. Rick is going to demonstrate to you. Can you all hear the sound there okay? Oh, sorry about that. Come on back. There we go. Dangerous. Rick is going to demonstrate to you, though, that just because we did not kill anyone, that this is every bit as dangerous and extraordinary a risk as has ever been undertaken. These are the easy parts you're looking at. This was an original thing we called Superman Crawl, too. Go through. I can get through that. So that's not a particularly tight squeeze in the scheme of what we're doing here. For those of you who are squeamish about closed spaces, you may look away because it gets worse. The, this is the type of journey that these remarkable scientists, the runners, the people who assisted us would take on a daily basis, usually three, four, five times a day, getting to these sites. Some people said to me, why haven't you opened this cave up? Well, I hope you can begin to see how fragile this cave is. You do not want to do any opening of caves in that environment, because if you do, you may destabilize the entire system and it could collapse. And secondly, I didn't want to do that. Who was it for me to destroy a cave that's potentially millions of years old? Just so it could be large enough that my ego could get in there. When there is technology and extraordinary people who have the capability of doing that work today. Here, this is kind of a normal narrow passage. And you're going to see the chute and parts of it here, and you'll get an idea of the depth as you see uh, Steve Tucker's light in the distance as we look down into the chute. You get an idea of how narrow those spaces are that they are traversing now. You'll see how dangerous some of the loose rocks are. This rock that Rick is about to touch actually fell on a National Geographic photographer, shattered his fingers as he was under there. Oh, and Rick can dislocate his shoulders much. I just show you that for fun. So you all now have something of an idea of what getting in there is like and working in there. And I was so excited by this idea that one of the things I started to do is I realized that the team started to live tweet what was going on, which had kind of never happened before. Literally hour after hour, there were tweets coming out about, oh, more fossils coming up. You know, oh, we just got, you know, a bit of a cranium and the whole bit. And so um, I started every evening here in Dallas putting together a list because my morning classes overlapped with the team excavating in um, South Africa. And so we occasionally could tweet back and forth, but then by the time midday here came around, things had been shut down for the night. So I wound up teaching my students about this in the afternoons from the collection of tweets. So every night then I just made short videos of that. And that wound up being really helpful for all the folks back in 2013 who weren't on Twitter, um, they got to see this thing firsthand. And I'm excited that nowadays, here we are, you know, going on almost 10 years later, this serves as a great primary source for that, that we actually get to see what happened, you know, hour by hour, which is an exciting part of that. And this is in that wakelet, by the way, that um, I'm sharing with all of you uh, later. So that was a neat thing. And to be able to be involved with that and to see it as it happened. And then by 2014, Dr. Berger came back to visit my students and he brought back some photos that were just unimaginable. Here you can see um, photographs of nearly complete feet. In the human fossil record, we have 
foot bones here and there, but not fully articulated complete feet. That is incredibly rare. And there, we have several of those in the um, Homo naledi collection. Same thing with hands. Those small bones you know, tend to get scattered in most fossil assemblages. And here we have you know, several complete, nearly complete hands with a very modern look to them, a longer thumb, but a hand that could certainly do modern gripping and uh, precision uh, tool use. So that, that's a possibility. Again, you know, individual uh, that you have lots of detail, not just scraps, but thousands of bones. This turned out to be the largest single fossil, human fossil collection in all of the continent of Africa. And if I'm correct, I believe it's number two or number three in the entire world. So it, you know, just a huge big deal. But then the question became, well, what did they have? And so 2014 was spent figuring out what those bones actually were. Um, the whole scientific process went through that. Um, I was not privy to that yet. I knew it was happening, but didn't know the details until July 2015 when I was invited to go back to the Rising Star Cave in Johannesburg. And I spent over a week with the team there. You can see the exploration team on the right there. Um, one of the main entrances, um, a skylight entrance to the um, Rising Star Cave in the middle. And then the, on the left is the actual entrance that the team used. And the great part of this visit, other than getting to wander into some of the parts of the cave, not, not to the deeper parts, but I got to interview all of the major players. And I have over a dozen long form interviews from 2015 of the team and getting a sense for their personalities, the excitement of what they got to experience. And I'm incredibly grateful, not only to the team members, but to Dr. Berger and Dr. Hawks, who made it possible for me to be able to do that, as well as um, my school being able to uh, support me and our parents association providing support to, for me to fly down to South Africa to make that happen. And then in September of 2015, the big announcement, you know, a, a worldwide announcement, certainly front page of the New York Times, all the major media outlets. And I show the cover of the New York Times here um, as a chuckle because they kind of goofed up. That's not a Homo naledi skull you see there. That is actually um, the skull of, a, of another species, Australopithecus africanus. Um, the initial Times um, photograph went up and then within a couple hours they had it fixed, but it was kind of funny. But worldwide, the world got to hear this story that you've um, just seen. And they got to understand a little bit about what Naledi actually seems to be. It's this fascinating mix of both very modern human features. And you can see here on the, le the left side of the center photo, the skull looks very human-like, kind of like a Homo erectus, but much, much smaller. Okay, you're talking about a skull, a brain size less than half the size of yours and mine. The hands, as I mentioned already, very modern. Okay, the legs and feet, again, very modern as well. Uh, you could take the, the bones of the feet, take those to a podiatrist today, and they could pass for a small human. But then on the right side here, there were some very primitive features. The shoulders looked almost like those of an ape. Uh, well adapted for movements that would be similar to climbing. Uh, the pelvis, while allowing upright walking like ours, it's more flared out, more like, say, Lucy's pelvis um, of three million years ago. Um, the hands, while modern, had a curvature to them that um, suggested, again, maybe another good adaptation for climbing. So it was this interesting kind of mosaic that when the team looked at them, had you seen just parts of it, you would have assigned it to different species. And so that's why when you see it all together, the idea of that this was one species named Homo naledi, um, naledi meaning star in honor of the rising star cave in the Sutu language. And then the next question, how did they get so deep in the rising star cave? 
you know, modern people with modern caving equipment. It takes more than a half hour to get from surface to Dinaletti. How are they doing it without presumably headlamps and all of our modern climbing gear? And some of the facts that um, came out and see if this mystery, if you can figure this out. We had over 15 individuals in that initial um, excavation, ranging in age from the infants to the elderly. Both, both males and females are present. The bones, uh, my favorite statement in all this from Dr. Berger was, these are the healthiest dead things I've ever seen. Um, there were no obvious signs of death on the skeleton. Then as you saw, the hands and feet were fully intact. So there hadn't been water and stuff moving things around. No predator damage. You know, the bones hadn't been moved by water sweeping through there. And in the um, chamber, there were no sediments or dirt from outside. So this had been an undisturbed area for some extended period of time. And there was no evidence of tools or debris or what I like to call paleo trash. No evidence that these individuals had been living there or been there for you know, a long time while they were alive. And so, you know, where do you find, you know, this in a modern setting? And it's interesting. I had a conversation years ago with a, um, a forensic scientist who said, yeah, the, who didn't know anything about Homo Naledi. And his assessment of this was, if he saw this, he'd say, you're excavating a cemetery. Because in modern times, this is the sort of uh, things that are, would be true for um, most of our cemeteries. And that came to be the hypothesis that the team had, that Naledi were bringing their dead deep into this cave in a, what is called ritualized body disposal. They're not calling it burial at this point, uh, but this is something that was repeated. It was done clearly over probably generations based on the archeology span of the site. And, um, this was not, you know, something as simple as we need to get rid of Uncle Bob because he's stinky and going to attract predators. This was, we're going to risk our lives to put this person in a really out of the way place. And that asked the question, you know, why were they doing that? What was the inspiration for doing that? Um, and, and that's part of what makes this mystery ongoing so interesting. And more on that coming up. And then one of the great things that Dr. Berger did is his team scanned a lot of the fossils and made them available for 3D printing. You're seeing my 3D prints of some of those initial pieces that um, I was then able to use in the week after uh, the announcement with my students. And currently, like for instance, here, if you look on the my video, this is a 3D uh, skull I, I printed out. And it's now available to anybody with a 3D printer. And I'm more than happy to help with that if you're interested in that, as well as uh, you'll have access to all, all of these 3D uh, files. Just as an example, on the left is the original fossil here. And on the right, there is my uh, 3D print of the same fossil. So we can have students actually working with um, and you know handling these fossils in the, their actual size, which is something that has never been available before. But this story keeps continuing. So I'm gonna give you some quick series of updates. In May of 2017, the team announced a second chamber, one in the opposite direction from the Dinaletti chamber. This I uh, called the Lassetti chamber and an elderly male skeleton of Homo Naledi named Neo and then they also announced at this time the estimated age of these fossils. And the Dinaletti chamber uh, basically dated to uh, sometime between 236 and 335,000 uh, years ago, which was much younger than they thought based on how primitive some of those parts of the skeleton were. So this presumably is a species that is antiquated near the, the base of when humans split off from Australopiths and then um, survive for potentially millions of years. 
and overlapping in time with early Homo sapiens in Africa. And so that's going to raise questions later on about when we find artifacts and things in South Africa, do we attribute them to Homo sapiens like we've always done? Or is it possible that Naledi may have had some uh, play in that? Then moving on to September of 2017, the original team gets back and they begin to undertake more fossils work and testing their hypotheses. They get more of NAO in the Lassetti chamber. And then underneath the uh, chute where, where presumably bodies were being dropped down, there was a cone of debris that needed to be excavated. And the idea was, is it possible if they're dropping bodies down that chute that, hey, there should be evidence of Naledi in this clump of debris. And indeed, um, there was evidence of that in this work. And then continuing on in September of 2017, they discovered more Homo Naledi fossils here in a different uh, part of the cave. If you look here, just to orient you, um, over on the right where my mouse is, you can see where it says the chute, and that's where you would enter the chamber, okay? Then if you follow me along where the 2013 excavation unit is, this little area, which is by the way, about the size of a card table, where those original over 1500 fossils were discovered. And now you notice all of these other small passageways, and these are tiny. They're really more fissures than anything else. And you can see where it says 2017 fossil discoveries. So it's not just in one spot, but you're seeing fossils throughout this Dinaletti chamber, as well as in some of the nooks and crannies away from it. More on that here in, um, in just a moment. And here on the left, you get a sense of this is Stephen Tucker in one of those fissures. He has to take his helmet off to be able to fit his head uh, through it. So that tells you how tiny um, and how small these areas are. And that becomes another big question. How are these Homo naledi remains getting into these incredibly small, tight places? Moving on even more in 2017, the team continuing their groundbreaking, sharing this stuff live as things happen. And they've got both of the chambers of the cave wired with Wi-Fi so that they can now um, talk to the world from inside the cave. Indeed, uh, the photograph you're seeing on the right there is Dr. Berger from the entrance to the cave uh, doing a middle school assembly with my students here in Dallas. Um, they did Facebook Live and reached over 40,000 uh, viewers. Nat Geo's Classroom Explorer had them live on four continents. Um, just amazing stuff to bring science um, you know, to, to the youth of the world in a way that had never been done before. Team goes back again in 2018, gets more of the stuff from the shoot. This is a part of that debris cone that they were able to remove and work its way up out of the shoot to uh, get into the lab to study. More of NAO was gotten there. And then 2021 saw the announcement of those fossils that were discovered in 2017, okay? From the chaos part of the cave. So here's chaos just to show you again where that is compared to the shoot on the right, the 2013 excavation, and now further down in you know, aspects of uh, the chaos area. And this is a small child, four to six years old named Letty, which translates to the lost one, because this child's skull was found on a ledge about 80 centimeters above the floor in 28 fragments with six teeth. You can see the reconstruction here in the middle, as well as my 3D print of it compared to an adult Homo naledi skull of Neo, as well as your skull or my skull there on the left. Um, so this very small skull, no other parts of the skeleton there. Raising the question, you know, again, how did it get there? But also, why just the skull in that spot? Is, was there some more th thought in the placement of it? It just didn't randomly get there. So again, asking more and more questions about what's going on there. And now here in... Um, just a few months ago, um, another 
big, big announcement uh, comes up. In August of 2022, Dr. Berger had gotten to the point where he had lost, I believe it was close to 50 pounds, and he finally is able to make it into the Dinaletti chamber. And in looking there, he looks up at the roof and he notices that large portions of the roof and, and parts of the chamber have soot on them. And you can see here, um, you're looking, imagine you're looking up, you're seeing the walls of the cave, and then the, the stuff that looks like snow, okay, is actually some of the calcium deposits in there, the, you know, stalactites. And um, you can see the black specks, all of that um, is soot. So clearly that there, there were fires that were being burned in the Dinaletti chamber at some point. And in one of the great bits of uh, serendipity along the way, um, Berger comes up out of the chute um, and it takes him a long time. It was a very, very difficult uh, way for him to get out, but he does, he recovers a little bit. And then um, one of the rising stars of paleoanthropology in um, South Africa, and indeed I say the world, kind of his number, number one person on the ground there helping to run um, the excavations now is Dr. Kanoe Molapani, and she tells, hey, I found something amazing. You need to see this. And simultaneously, while he was discovering soot, she was there seeing a small hearth, a small fire pit. By the way, there she is on the right with Dr. Berger. And here's part of this fire pit with charred animal bones. And this is in that dragon's back chamber just before the climb up uh, to go down the chute. And so they both find evidence of fire um, you know, within, you know, minutes of each other, which is, I just think that's a fascinating story. And then as the team expanded and looked in other chambers, um, they certainly found evidence of charcoal in a number of other spots. So it opens up the idea that Homo Naledi was using fire. Much has to be done to figure out the age of these fires. Um, but clearly animals were being cooked deep in the cave. Um, so it suggests lots of possibilities that, again, the mystery keeps building. Um, and this all will be undergoing peer review. There'll be papers coming out about that. Um, and about the same time as Dr. Berger, you know, sharing all this, he started to, to hint about other things. You know, what else is, is next? And you can see here from December of 2022, this is a tweet and I am someone I love, my students will tell you, I love cliffhangers. Um, and he appeals to my cliffhanger style here. Um, so he admits to us uh, through Twitter that he has a terrible, shameful admission. The fire, which by itself is a huge big deal. You know, it's not the big discovery he's been tweeting about. There's a bigger one. And indeed, he says, there are three bigger ones than fire coming. Now, has he um, had a chance to announce those yet? No, he hasn't. They're still undergoing um, peer review and the like. Um, but there are some hints out there. And just last month, for instance, Dr. Berger is going up to Copenhagen, Denmark. And he's got this case here, you can see that. By itself, that doesn't necessarily tell us much other than there are some specimens in there. And then we can see he thanks the staff at um, Tambo International Airport, which is the international airport in Johannesburg. Um, he's got 19 Homo Naledi uh, fossil samples headed uh, by way of Dubai to Copenhagen. And then, to a research institute that is known for focusing on biomolecules, in particular um, DNA and protein. So the, um, the feeling is there's a good chance that um, we may get news related to those topics at some point. And if DNA was recovered from any of these, 
I believe it would make it um, the oldest human uh, DNA to come certainly out of any African specimens. Um, and so that would be um, incredible, but we have to wait and see on that. However, come uh, this summer, Dr. Berger has a uh, book coming out, Cave of Bones, which presumably will um, share with us a lot of these other new um, experiences and the like. So that that awaits. And the thing I love is this is research that is not done. These discoveries that will be announced are going to open a whole new wave of questioning. Uh, there'll be, I imagine there'll be pushback as there often is in science. Um, and as this stuff needs to be proven and worked on even more, this is opportunity for young scientists to really rise to the forefront. Um, and even for those of us who are teachers to um, have our, encourage our students to be in the future of this research. Again, not something, as I said at the beginning, that is discovered and then done. No, this is stuff that's ongoing. And this kind of wraps us up to where we are now, but I've mentioned it a number of times about resources that I certainly use with my students. And so what I have um, for all of y'all is this wakelet. It's kind of a way for me to combine things together for people, one-stop shopping. And rather than this uh, long uh, link there, um, for those of you who want to, you can grab the um, QR code there and um, access all of my stuff here, which includes a whole bunch of Homo Naledi videos, because in our time here today, I don't have nearly enough time to go into all the cool detail that, that is out there. Um, my Twitter play-by-play -play from the original um, excavation, as well as my interviews from 2015 are there, okay? Um, 3D printing resources. There are a number of sites that have great hominid fossils, including Morphosource, where all of the Sediba and Homo naledi files are stored. So there are links to all of that. So if you are inclined to dig into that, you have that ability. And I'm certainly more than happy uh, to help along the way. And I have social media links for a number of the Naledi scientists so that you can follow along with this as it continues to evolve. And then I also have um, my contact information there if you want to get in touch with me about this. Um, I'm more than happy to do that. Um, it is exciting that there is so much stuff here. Um, Dr. Berger's book coming out this summer will be exciting. Um, you know, for the, the world of uh, students, especially middle school students who I am near and dear to my heart, um, you know, I love telling this story to them because they get so involved on that. And I'm working on a project that hopefully will uh, have some news in the near future that will allow these resources to reach a large uh, portion of middle school students as well. And so, um, Kenny, I'm gonna wrap up here. What questions do we have from folks? I'm happy to um, do that. Thanks, John. All right, John, that was excellent as always. Um, in the beginning, you had a lot of questions about fire and fire usage <laughs> and do they use fire? But I think we, I think we answered that. Or yeah, and I think the um, the fire question is one that, that there is still a, a a lot of research that needs to go in. Um, there's a lot of talk about getting the age of the fire, um, and what will that mean? Um, you know, some of the pushback initially was, well, okay, there's charcoal in this cave. Is that modern? Is you know, are we going to find? Oh, you know, that's from ten years ago. Or um, are we going to find out that no, indeed, you know, this fire is from you know three hundred thousand years ago. So, so that work will need to get done, and that is a trickier uh, job to do than most people think of offhand. But that is ongoing research. All right, uh, we had a comment that says, "Great to see the exploration technicians represented in your talk." Thanks, John. Yeah. And, and I would say, yeah, the exploration technicians, you know, in a, in a short talk like this, 
it's hard to tell you how much they did. My time getting to meet with them back in 2015, they are, they are to this day, they still go out and are searching for new, um, new fossil sites because early on there were, there are hundreds of caves out there that have potential that need to have, have human eyes uh, put on them and knowledgeable human eyes, as well as looking at maybe some of the older uh, fossil sites that um, with new eyes may reveal new, new surprises. And I think uh, we're going to be seeing news from some of those sites. There's one, two in particular that come to mind for me. One is Gladys Vale, um, which is not very far, just a few kilometers away from the Sediba site. And it is offering some promising new stuff, as well as maybe 200 yards away from the Rising Star Cave, there's another site called the 105 site that is being excavated that has some really fascinating things coming out of it. So, and those will, those would not have been possible if it weren't for the work of the exploration teams. All right, very good. Uh, Jessica says, I am a recent anthropology graduate and want to work in the field. How do you suggest breaking into this career path? Um, probably, and not knowing exactly uh, where you are, but I would say, you know, in addition to your classes, talk to your professors. Um, field schools are an amazing opportunity for especially younger graduate students to get in the field and get experience. One of the problems is if you go to most of the established teams and say, hey, I'm gung ho, I want to do this. They'll say, great, what, what have you done? What's your, you know, you have to have, and the catch 22 of, you have to have experience to get experience. And so what field schools allow you to do is to get out and be able to, um, to get that experience as someone who's not yet experienced. All right, very good. When I was a, in an undergraduate, I did a three-week study abroad in Costa Rica, and we studied primates. And it was literally advertised for like inexperienced people to get field training. And that program is still going on. It's called Don D A N T A. And this year, they are going to one or two African countries to study chimpanzees. That is great. Yeah. And that's the thing that, you know, there, and there are lots of folks out there who just don't know what the pathway is. For me, I grew up in love with paleoanthropology. You know, some people had their, um, their invisible friend. I had my extinct friend, Australopithecus boisei. <laughs> and um, I got to high school and then college, and I wasn't even aware that anthropology was like a field you could go into because I didn't have anyone in those days, you know, pointing me in that direction. All right, very good. Um, I mentioned that Dan Danta program because Kevin Hunt gave a presentation on chimpanzees, and he now is associated with that. Uh, program that I did like 17 years ago. So he did a program awesome. for ties. All right, I'm going to jump around, but I will do all of them. But this is related to the field technicians. Um, yay for serendipity. What an amazing experience. Did anyone on the team accidentally find out they were actually claustrophobic once in the cave system? Um, I can't speak for everybody. But I know um, a part of their interview process was, you know, making sure that they had a sense of how comfortable are you in ridiculously tight spaces. Um, and in my talks with several of the original underground astronauts, they said, no matter what you did, you know, hiding under your bed, you know, trying to squeeze into places at home that might mimic this, it's different when it's for real <laughs> and in the cave. Um, but yes, um, a, a, a number of them said it wasn't quite what they thought it was going to be that way. And it was challenged, but I don't think, um, it wound up being a game change, a game breaker for any of them, at least that I've heard. You have a couple of, uh, questions regarding where they can get the website or details for 3d prints of 
Pulmone ledi or hominids in general? Um, that is in that wakelet that I uh, shared. And, I'll, and we can go back and, and put it back up here in a moment. Um, I am, it's all in there. So that way, and, and you'll, it's real clear cut. There's one of the uh, sub subfolders is 3D printing resources, which has morphosource.com, which is the, uh, the repository for Naledi and Australopithecus sediba. But there are also others unrelated like africanfossils.org, which has a lot of the uh, leaky families stuff from uh, Kenya. Um, so on and so forth. So there's lots of neat stuff there. And if you're watching this as a recording, it will be in the description below. Blake says, I think I remember Dr. Berger saying that there were dozens of papers being written about the findings. Do you know if these have been submitted or when they will be published? Um, yeah, there a num basically as far as I know, I think most of the, you know, discoveries that have been teased, um, they are they are in process. Um, but that process tends to be painfully slow. Um, those of you who have ever done any research work know the, the power of reviewer number two. <laughs> um, all right, we got a couple of human evolution questions. This was really interesting, John. I don't know much about human evolution. I'm so excited to develop my first unit soon. Thank you, Ties, for the great resources. And then uh, we have a comment. I'm retired, but I'm also curious if you could push back on still on teaching evolution, maybe specifically human evolution. In Texas, push back on human evolution. I don't understand what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, occasionally, yes. Um, the, the nice thing is for me teaching it as, um, as a middle school teacher, a lot of what I can present it as initially is adventure stories of discovery and that helps a lot in having students have buy into the reality of it for them occasionally i will have parents come and and talk to me and you know i have a number of ways depending on the approach of the parents usually it's parents are like well this isn't our thing but we appreciate you for opening up our child's mind to it um, we're teaching him something different at home. Um, occasionally when I get a very, very hardcore, um, you know, pushback, I said, I will go with the path of, okay, if you're going to be so certain that all this is wrong, you have to understand and have the details so you can make a good argument against it. And usually in that, when I say, okay, I'm willing to like, have you come in for tutoring after school where we can dig into this and you can hit me with your best shots. And we'll figure this out. And inevitably, what then happens is they realize, oh, okay, it does make sense to me. And a lot of what they are taught by anti evolution forces just doesn't quite hold up. And so that winds up being helpful. But you need time on that. It's not something that's easily addressed in the, ooh, I have 30 seconds in class to counter your claim. It yeah. doesn't work so easily <laughs> that way. So thank you, John, for answering that. And the reason why I did address it is because that's kind of the purpose of TIES. We want to empower teachers. And that's why every webinar I ask for experienced teachers to offer TIES tips about how to make children who are told that their religion can't allow their understanding of evolution, how do you make them feel comfortable? So thank you for that, John. All right. All right, I think, John, I think we're going to end because we're kind of out of time. You do have quite, okay. a, few, you do have quite a few comments saying thank you. Um, thank you for sharing your enthusiasm. And I'm sure your pupils will love this and all these classes and subjects. Yeah. All right, yeah, Patty, well, Patty wanted to know, was any uh, DNA able to be extracted from the bones? Yep. The, the latest I had heard from Dr. Berger, uh, it was a talk he gave, I think the talk itself was November-ish. Um, he was optimistic, but um, the official answer is nothing yet. But again, there, there seems to be optimism from him, and he has said that publicly, so. All right. 
And with that, uh, we actually have another TIES webinar tomorrow. It's about mammalian evolution. And that's going to be it for this school year. And then we will be back with our monthly webinars in September. And John and I are going to the Grand Canyon in June. <laughs> yes, we are. Looking forward to that a whole lot. Yes. So wait, can, you, can I, um, for folks who are still here, can I share the screen back so we can put the, the wakelet uh, yes. up again? Just that way. Um, there we go. Everyone, can everyone see that? So if you need to get a picture of the QR code or even try and take a photo of the uh, the link itself, uh, that should be available for you. And I appreciate all of y'all being here uh, today for this. This is uh, it's such a, a fun, exciting story that you know keeps going on and on and on. And I hope y'all will feel free to share your experience with it, with your students, with your, your adult friends in whatever way uh, works for you.